The magnificent promise of occupational therapy is to enable people from all walks of life to engage and participate in activities and processes that have value. People's lives are unique and highly complex. Circumstances differ from person to person, from instance to instance, from context to context. This is the postmodern condition. Though most occupational therapists currently practice uh, to deal with patients' embodied pathologies, I believe occupational therapy's greatest potential and value is to help the client who is experiencing the pathology to navigate and overcome the complex challenges and experiences of day-to-day -day life uh, that are consequent to that pathology. Life is like a river. Occupational therapists help people's lives to flow and go better. Imagine your life as a river, starting up in the highlands where the rains and natural springs give forth streams which pulled by gravity meander and flow over varying terrain until it flows into the sea or evaporates and stops. At some point the river flows deep and wide. At other points the water is forced to flow turbulently through channels narrowed by rocks, encroaching river walls, and drift excuse me, driftwood. Every person's river is unique and occupational therapy can help your life to flow better. If at any point you took a cross section of the river, it would reveal a certain unique configuration of rocks and driftwood which combine with the river walls to determine flow of water. The rocks are difficulties or problems identified by the person. They come in all different sizes, shapes, and numbers, just like life. Driftwood are personal factors or resources. The river walls can represent environmental factors, both physical and social. All of these combine together to create a unique configuration of circumstances that ultimately determine flow. The water that courses through and by these structures is a person's life flow or occupation. How does your river flow? That is the Kawa model in its simplest explanation. It can be used in a variety of ways in whatever way or modification allows for greater flow. On the surface, the Kawa model seems like some benign, novel, lightweight metaphor developed in some faraway place that while amusing to look at, does not offer anything more than what our existing models do. However, it is an exemplar for how models and frameworks will look uh, as the industrialized world and its systems of care and social welfare move deeper through the postmodern condition. Whether you use the Kawa or another metaphor, the paradigm shifting model heralds an important and fundamental change in how we understand and use conceptual models in occupational therapy. Let me finish by sharing with you how. How does the Kawa model herald a paradigm shift in occupational therapy? It turns um, the former paradigm on its head. That's how. <laughs> At the end of the day, our work is about helping the client, whether individual, family, or community, um, with what they experience in daily life. This model makes occupational therapy all about the client's narrative or their story, told in their own words. Each client has a unique experience of daily life and worldviews. The Kawa is merely a metaphor or vehicle to bring the client's narrative into greater appreciation by the occupational therapist, as it is told in the client's own words. Um, we claim that our, that our conventional approaches to OT are client-centered. How is it then that we take the answers given by our clients to these questions and frameworks that we bring from another reality? and proceed to change the client's story into a standard, sophisticated uh, set of concepts um, dictated by our universal models. Rather than a modernist or logical positivist view of models and theory, the Kawa model is the first conceptual model based on a social constructionist philosophical view. This is the first model whereby the client actually becomes the theorist. They actually build a unique model, their own model, 
They name the concepts and explain the relationships or principles connecting the key concepts together that form and come together um, to, to, to make their narrative. According to the Kawa model, we, the occupational therapists, assume the role of student. We become students of the client's model or story, looking for ways to make it work. So instead of us cultivating the client to meet the cultural requirements of occupational therapy, this model does the very opposite. It requires occupational therapy to be cultivated to meet the requirements of the client. The problem of culture is neutralized through the use of this model when we make it all about the client and how they view and experience and, and, and experience uh, their daily life challenges. The story or narrative that matters the most is told in the client's own words or concepts. The benchmarks of success are not always about meeting some external standard or medical requirement. The markers of success become highly personalized according to what the client defines as their goals. Instead of the so-called colonial practice of foisting a Western-centric, culture-bound concept of occupation onto all clients and rendering occupational therapy to be the most misunderstood profession in the world, the Kawa model goes beyond semantics and makes the interpretation of occupation by the client to be the most important. I contend that occupation can be an excluding construct that privileges and resonates with a select number of people who have been socialized into a particular definition of the term. It does not exist in the lexicons of many, many cultures and even those who abide in Western English um, speaking uh, contexts. Um, so there are many within our profession, for example, who disagree um, with the universal applic uh, applicability of our core concept. The Kawa model goes beyond this sacred text and makes it about the client's view of what they feel they want and need to do in their day-to-day -day lives. When occupational therapy becomes more relevant to the client's world of meanings, when we make the client the expert of their own life, and we base occupational therapy on the client's unique story, we will find that the usual boundaries and categories that we place our clients into will disappear. With the Kawa model, there is no labeling and categorizing of people into functional status groups, nor divisions into physical dysfunction or mental health or diagnostic groups, or even in terms of status of acute or chronic. That language goes out the window when we make it about day-to-day -day life experiences of our clients and what is important to them. The magnificent promise of occupational therapy still stands before us to enable people from all walks of life to engage and participate in activities and processes that have value. The world is waiting for an occupational therapy that relates to their basic struggles and needs in everyday life. Can we do it? Can we deliver on the magnificent promise? Can we get beyond our colonial attitudes and modernist worldviews to transform our occupational therapy into one that all of our diverse clients and societies can comprehend and value? I end with a quote from a budding young occupational therapist in Southeast Asia that I met on the internet. Her name is Joyin Teo, and these are her words of wisdom. Occupational therapy through the Kawa model comes down to this. How does the client want to live their life so that it is more meaningful to them? And let's look together with them at what we can do to achieve that. Thank you very much. Uh, I've gone a little bit over time. I'm into almost 41 minutes. But um, let's continue uh, with now a conversation about some of these ideas and open it up for questions and discussion. I'll meet you back uh, over at the World Occupational Therapy Day site uh, and we'll use Illuminate to uh, engage uh, in your impressions of this presentation. 
the Kawa model, the state of occupational therapy today, and beyond. See you there in a few minutes. Bye for now.